Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today for my talk. Firstly, I'd like to thank Autodesk for inviting me to Autodesk University. I'd also like to thank you for your interest in my talk and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. My name is Nigel Hunt. I am a director and producer who has worked in the industry for the past 30 years, working in AEC and media and entertainment. These days, I am involved in a few different businesses and activities. Uh, today's talk focuses on Urban, which is a visual effects and production company. We also do art fizz. I'm also a co-owner of Sinai Software, where we'll touch on some of the plugins, the 3ds Max plugins, uh, today in this talk. Uh, I am the editor of Three Disciple, which is a ArcViz magazine. Plus, I'm one of the co-organizers of 3DS London. Uh, have been, or this year, was a lead judge for the Rookies and exec producer for 24 Hours of Chaos, which was a community event that took place in September this year. So... Looking at the agenda for today, three things that I'd quite like to cover. One, I think it's really important that we dive into the background and relevant experience over three decades and that led to essentially working on large scale master planning and city scale projects. And I quickly will just go over some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Next let's discuss the project itself, which is Wembley Park in London, United Kingdom. I've been working on the project for 12 years, and I want to outline the project itself, the project management, production pipeline, and software development to keep control and maintain such an enormous, massive 3D asset. Finally, we're going to talk about the digital app itself, what I want to discuss the client brief, our assessment and technical limitations, and our solution and final deliverables. So let's get started. Okay. Let's start with right at the beginning with a nice picture of my hometown, which is Christchurch, New Zealand. Now, we're going back a few years, and I'm sure most of you, or a lot of you, may not have even been born in 1988. So bear with me. I was first introduced to AutoCAD at college whilst I was studying architectural design. And at the time, my first impressions of this computer-aided design was that I thought I could draw faster on my drawing board. So I didn't take it that seriously. And then then I went traveling in 1992 and unintentionally ended up settling in London. At the time, during the 90s, computer graphics were taking off. And it was taking off in architectural sense as well. So I had got myself an early job, um, or, well, a job with uh, Sega. I then started, I thought I should get back into architecture itself. So I went back to college and I studied AutoCAD and started using a renderer called AccuRender. And then, so this image here that you can see, that's one of my first or early images created in 1993 or four uh, using AutoCAD and AccuRender. I quickly moved over in 94 over to 3D Studio, uh, release three, and started producing this sort of image. Before then moving into 3D Studio, um, I formed my um, my own company called Glowfrog in 1996 and went through quite a few different renderers over the time. Uh, this, this image was produced in the 1990s. Also thought it would be worth mentioning that I co-founded a 3ds Max and Autodesk, sorry, AutoCAD plugins uh, company called Replica Nation, which I'll quickly touch on in a second. So the foundations of the architectural visualization industry, especially in the United Kingdom, began in the late 1980s 
with the formation of Hayes Davidson. Now, I started my studio in 1996, so you can see there that I was one of the early adopters of the art form, uh, closely followed by a lot of other familiar faces. But as you can see from this chart, the industry over the years or the last 30 years has exploded and today the United Kingdom has more than 170 ArcViz studios working in it. As I mentioned before, Replicanation that I co-founded in 1998 was my first go at developing for 3D Studio Max. The idea behind this came about from freelancing in and around the London architectural scene where I identified that, you know, from architect to architect, everybody was trying to create all the same furniture models. So with venture capital backing, we started a company, we started working with 50 of the world's leading furniture brands. Uh, we grew the company to 65 people with offices in the UK, the US, Europe and India. And at its peak, the website had around 25,000 artists, architects and interior designers who were all using our tools, both in 3D Studio Max and also for AutoCAD. The file format allowed you to do is essentially you could, it was product placement, you could place a chair in your Max scene, you could then swap it out, just select a different manufacturer, that would swap, it would update your 3ds maxing and if you wanted it could also update all your CAD drawings as well. So in 2001 the company was voted within the top 100 computer graphic businesses and I got named the face of 3D. <laughs> that that was backed by venture capital and uh, the the whole dot-com boom, uh, if any of you know about that, the business ran out of money and like a lot of other dot-com businesses, it went to the wall. So I went back to focusing on growing Glowfrog into a multi-discipline company. We started getting into broadcast visual effects and graphics as well as architectural visualization. Uh, the business was around for 20 years. Uh, in that time, we had more than 200 clients, worked on 3,000 projects, worked in 40 countries and produced over 150 hours of TV content. Some of our select clients included blue chip architects and developers, uh, TV networks such as Netflix, Universal, HBO and we also got the opportunity to work with sovereignty, including the Kuwait and Saudi royal family. Quickly, I'll just jump over some of the TV and film projects that I have either directed or been the VFX supervisor of over the years. Uh, there's a few of them. This also includes some of the branded architectural films as well. Today we're really going to focus just on urban design and some of the lessons that I've learned over the years using computer graphics. Let's jump into it. Long-term projects. Looking at a timeline, of course, knowledge is acquired over time and it's a process of trial and error and learning and refining with each new job. You can see how a lot of the jobs that were worked on for more than a decade that allows us to really acquire a good sense of, of what the client needs, but also build up a database. So let's just have a quick look at some of these jobs. Greenwich Peninsula started in around 2001, 2002. Uh, the experience that we gained over an 11 year period was really to do with project staging and reusing the 3D assets. Don't think of your, your job as actually being finite. You're going to actually use it again and again, and you're going to refine and perfect it, and things are going to move forward and advance and get more and more detail. Over the period of time, the project ended up with more than 300 models, hundreds of X-Revs, 
we started to work with V-Ray. So of course we started down a V-Ray proxy pipeline, but really this experience was to do with project staging and learning how an actual project goes through its life cycle. Next, with London winning the 2012 Olympics, we were invited and won the pitch to actually work on all the, if you like, the off-site side of the project. That meant we didn't work on stadiums, but we worked on Athletes Village and we worked on the surrounding retail areas as well. That entailed that we worked with more than 40 architects, engineers and clients, and we discovered very quickly that we were the eyes on the project for the entire delivery team that we worked with. And what that really means is that, say, when an architect came into our office and they'd asked us, oh, look, you know, can we actually have a view? Let's look out this window at, you know, there, there should be a spectacular view out there. And we would say, you do realize there's a, a large retaining wall or there is a, you know, there's a large building in that view. And of course, because the actual overall design team weren't working and with a global model, they didn't know, they, they weren't able to see. So we became the eyes on the project. And that's been an ongoing theme through the years that we've been working. So keep that in mind that your visualization skills have a lot more value to your developer or your client going forward. Limassol Marina, which is in Cyprus. We started this in 2008. And at the time, just thinking back to the processing power that we had, you know, computers weren't as powerful as they are these days. So one of the things that we had to address really, really quickly is how do we optimize a 3D scene for massive data sets, including on this job, because it was a marina, we had super yachts. We had, there were 600 yachts that we had to place in and use. We then had to actually work on multi-levels of detail. We ended up building a massive proxy setup. As you can see here, we had more than three and a half thousand proxies. There were tons of XREF. So we really started to develop the pipeline that we still use today. Quickly, I suppose, let me just show you one of the shots. So every rock here is a proxy, all the trees, Everything but the background here is all 3D. So it was a great fun job to work on. Okay. Next is one of the TV series that we worked on called Metropolis. The experience that we took away from this is that because of the actual scale and ambition of the series, we needed to actually start to develop our own tools and scripts. The premise of the show was we needed to rewind cities back to the origin. In this shot, we show New York rewinding back to the very beginning. Now to do this, the, the producers wanted to actually see the, the buildings actually rewinding themselves. So we developed scripts to do that. And here, here's one of the construction scripts that our animators and artists could employ on a a site by site basis run the script and that was going to build all the scaffolding and everything visual that from a wider shot it would look quite cool this shot here told the story of the with the invention of of the elevator it became the birth of skyscrapers so here's new york all popping up literally we try to keep the timing but you know that sort of shot took a, a week or so to, to complete so moving on again with the same series metropolis we built uh tudor london uh, using splines and then one of the scripts that we built um, quickly built the Tudor buildings for us and here's one of the shots again took around a week to complete once the splines were laid out but you can see on the right here all the buildings are different sizes it's built on the fly 
and really, really fun, fun way of working. So yeah, developing your own script are going to save you a lot of time and effort. So next, we looked at simulating reality. So for an aerial shot like this, you know, it would look quite boring if there was no traffic moving. So we decided we we started adopting uh, city traffic, uh, which is a plugin for 3D Studio Max. And here you can see it's it's using AI to the traffic is stopping at intersections. It's moving correctly around the city. And of course, there's around 30,000 cars in this shot alone. But it just adds that level of detail to, to your shot. So next, we were invited onto this project by the production company working with the Kuwait royal family. This was a concept film, and so there were no designers involved. We were asked to concept design a city that was the size of Singapore. Again, from what I've just said before about some of the scripts and tools, we continued to actually develop techniques to be able to create shots like this, very, very quickly of, of cities and to try and give a sense of scale and, and futurism. On-site filming, I, as supervisor, I spent two months in the Middle East uh, filming backplates and working with the principal photography and the, the production crew uh, to produce shots like this and backplates and, of course, we drop the CGI in, into the shots. Now, moving on to the next job, which is Dubai Creek Harbour, which is one of the largest master plans in the world. This project is, when it's eventually finished, is going to have around 450,000 people living and working there. Now, when Ema, the developer, approached us for this. They, their initial conversation was that they wanted a 30-second film flying from um, Burj Khalifa to the new site. And, and, of course, we dismissed that immediately because you can't see anything in 30 seconds. So we opted to produce, here's, here's a storyboard from the film, a day in the life of the project. But the takeaway from this... It's really when we drilled down to it, and it was a lifestyle film, so we needed to be authentic to the people, the culture, and, of course, the local rules and customs. So instead of using off-the-shelf characters that you can get today, we opted to model, 3D model, every single character, obeying the, the modesty laws, plus from, from the local customs point of view, we started to develop 3D models of the different cultures. So the UAE, the Saudis, they all wear different headgear and different headsets. And it's very, very sensitive to ensure that you get the, if you like, the headscarf, just a little fold. People can tell whether they're from Saudi or whether they're from Doha or, or within the region. So we needed to pay attention to that. So here are some of the modest characters, cloth simulation, and one of the final shots where you've got people dipping their toes in the water and sitting there enjoying the sunset. Really, this shot is from one of our own IP, uh, our own project, which is Ancient Rome. This is bringing everything together over time we are continuing to develop this model and it's going to serve multiple purposes, mainly for TV producers who may want access to this model for an upcoming TV show or publishers. But it's, yeah, it's a passion project that we've been working on for some time. And you can see here we're dialing in a lot of detail where we have worked originally with a university and now... We're producing things like this, which is a, a nice 360 panorama of the city itself. As and when we find time to continue working on it, 
we jump into a different zone and start working up the detail of the buildings more based on research. Okay. Let's recap what I've just talked about. So from the beginning, always plan for a multi-year stage delivery if you can. Try and work that into your pipeline. You are the eyes on the entire project with many, many stakeholders. So bear that in mind. Um, also design a pipeline that you know can scale to massive data sets. And then consider writing software and scripts to meet the demands of your workflow. It's always surprised me how many people, or if you're going to build a studio, you should have someone who can actually write tools, whether that's Mac script or Python. Definitely look into doing that. Next, design and simulate real world traffic, people, trees move, cars move, people move. Everything's always moving. So try and actually build in a simulation pipeline into your workflow. And then finally, research and push for authenticity and attention to detail. Make sure you're culturally sensitive to the characters and the people that you actually put into your work. Right, let's look at Wembley Park, the project that uh, you've all joined me today for. Wembley Park in London, UK. So Quintain is the developer. It's one of London's most exciting new neighborhoods and the largest single site of build to rent homes in the UK. Quintain acquired the site in 2002. Here on the right hand side, we've got the master plan itself and a CGI of the site as it's progressed. Um, a few stats about the project itself. It's 85 acres, which works out at about 85 football pitches. Uh, we've worked on around 90 buildings. That includes the buildings on site and the adjoining neighborhoods. And these include residential, commercial, retail, sports and leisure. Now, Quintang started on site in, well, commenced in 2002 and it's due for completion in 2027 so it's around 25 years of development and there are eight and a half thousand residential homes on site a monstrous massive site and we have been looking after all the cgi side of it so here pre-2002 the old wembley stadium it's quite industrial looking how it looks this year it's really charging through really 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 massive project from one to the other of pro um, progress i should say looking at this over time here is a little time lapse animation we produce it goes back to the 1770s i think working all the way through the centuries to where we're at now This, of course, is sped up, and I've taken out all the information overlays that, that accompany the film, but we needed to research 250 or so years of how the site's changed. Here's our 3D model of where it stands today. As I, may, I mentioned before, we've been 12 years on this. In that time, I'm just showing you how many live models there are, there's, there's 750 or more, there's hundreds of XREFs, there's thousands of proxies. And again, we are still using 3ds Max and V-Ray. So looking then at the visualization project stages that we work to, I've broken that down into four stages. So stage A is the planning stage where we began in 2008, we were commissioned to work with the planning team on early concepts and site analysis. Following that, we moved through the design cycle. As the master plans approved, building plots are sent out to tender with architects. And as they are selected, every architect has, has to use Revit and submit the Revit models to the, the project teams in which we then bring those Revit models into the master viz model for client review. 
Next, we have the construction stage where the 3D model is used not only for, for a planning and visualization side, but we also start to use that for looking at things such as temporary construction structures or tower cranes, vehicle logistics and pedestrian flows. And finally, stage D, we're looking at the marketing side of things so that the highly detailed 3D model or digital twin of the site is used in PR, it's used in marketing for public to stakeholders, commercial and residential tenants. So we're producing films, images, 360 panoramas, schematic illustrations and interactive apps, which we're going to get onto in a minute. Looking at that in more diagrammatic form, now how's the project sort of move through in stages? So if you like, if we start with from the left, we have the concept stage. So projects are actually saved into our client database. Once, once they've been approved, that will move through into the planning stage. So again, we're drawing down from the database into a specific project. As that gets refined and detailed, that gets saved back into the database. And you can see this circular process moves through the whole of the cycle until we get down to the operational level. Now, what we're doing when we get down to marketing and, and operation level in stage D is we're evaluating the model that we have against the as-built details and we're updating that model so it actually matches what has been built on site to allow us to finish off essentially with a digital twin likeness um, for our client. So here's a, a little sample of the, if you like, the concept design back in, in the early days right through to one of the CGI's, the aerial CGI's of the site. If we move on then to talk about the software pipeline that we're using. So at the start of the project and every project we work on, we, we have to assess the software that we use and also really look at the off-the-shelf limitations of that software. So we analyze our proposed pipeline and mixing and matching tools to meet our specific needs. We also aren't afraid of writing all our own tools, as I sort of mentioned before. So step one, we assess the brief based on our past experience. We then design a software plan and work methodology. We write scripts and bespoke plugins. And then we reassess every year or so that our pipeline is rock solid for that coming year and adjust it as necessary. So looking at the image on the right, our primary tools we'll use for importing everything on this particular project is coming in in Revit. It's a requirement from the client itself that all consultants must use Revit on the project. Secondly, some will be using AutoCAD or, or other, other tools. 3D modeling is all done in 3D Studio Max. Plus, we're using the Sinai tools. So plugins, we're using Ignite extensively. Plus, we use Forest Pack. Rendering is all done in V-Ray. Real-time, we are using Project Lavina, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then for 2D, we're using the Adobe Creative Cloud. Now, secondary to that, we do use other tools. So from a rendering point of view, on a project basis, we may use Corona. We may use Arnold and of course we do use Unity and we will use Unreal Engine as well. Like most studios we'll use everything. Now looking at our long-term 3D pipeline we need to ensure that that scales. I think one of the things that most experienced visualizers will identify with is there is a tried and tested architect to visualize a workflow but we needed to look at how can we disrupt that can we actually make changes can we perfect it can we actually make it better is designing tools that speed up the iteration process useful is it going to ease the visualization team's frustration when each week or each month the architects resubmit 
the next iteration of a building and the visualizers have to actually redo all their work once again. Now, that costs us money as a business. So we need to actually look at how can we actually make cost savings and is an investment in software to, to do that going to be beneficial? We also need to look at how we future-proof and protect against talent churn and software trends. Now what I mean by talent churn is a project that lasts 12 years, you'd be lucky if all of your team stick around for that time. So your team are gonna come and go but your project's going to stay with you for potentially 10 years or more. So you've got to protect against that and actually put in place those methodologies that stay with you as a company and don't allow new talent to come in and actually try and change that without a really good reason. Uh, the same applies to software trends. Your project's going to be around for some time to make sure you are using tried and tested software. So here's the 3ds Max model. You can see we've got the on-site, but we've also built the surrounding context as well, just to allow us to be able to place the camera anywhere on site. I thought we should just dive into looking at the the BIM to 3ds Max importing process, the steps that we go through for every model that comes to us and this actually applies to every revision as well step one is importing and we import everything as fbx next step two we prepare that 3d model for 3d studio max then we apply the materials and we save to the client database and that then gets saved to the relevant zone model now, just looking at step two here, which is part of the, the prep process, for every model that comes in, we have developed a very efficient way of cleaning up and fixing these models before they get saved into the overall project database. Now, one of the tools that we recommend is Sinai's free forensic, which is available from the Autodesk App Store. But we also use Sinai's extensive plugin collection called Ignite, which allows us to create layers, consolidate all the imported objects to smaller, smaller details. So we're, we're saving everything down to layers by materials. We're removing clutter. On a master plan, you may not want to have things such as door handles and tiny objects. So we'll use Jumble to just delete unwanted or unnecessary detail. And then we fix the geometry and remove things such as double faces. Now, a lot of visualization studios may opt to actually rebuild the imported models, but we have gone down a different route. And if I actually just talk over or show you a sample of what I mean. So here's forensic. I'm checking that scene. First things first is remove the CAD blocks. But you can see here, you can actually empty the layers. One of the things that's really important is look out for motion clips, animation layers, because they are going to come in sometimes with your Revit models, and they're going to really screw with you and, and slow things down. So you can see here from the layers that I just brought up, everything's coming on the default layer. So that's quite difficult to work with sometimes. So I've just run Ignite and created all the materials by layer, layer by materials, I should say, sorry. Um, now what I want to do is weld the verts. So I've opened up Sculpt and I weld all, all the verts. I am then going to attach everything by material. So that's gonna collapse everything down into what is essentially 17 separate objects. We're gonna clear the smoothing groups and unify the normals. Then finally, what I want to do is detach all the double faces that may have come in with the imported Revit model. So you can see here, 
we've got 17 objects to run through. Uh, we really, really recommend that you collapse everything down to single objects or, or, or attach by material first. Otherwise, that process is going to take you quite some time. But they were all the double faces. So let's move on. Last thing, let's reset all the objects. And that model now is ready to be saved into the database. So that little film, that was running at double speed. But you can see it's a pretty quick process. So here's some of the 3D models, the images from them. Once we've brought the actual building models into the project, we then we've divided the master plan up into into building zones or separate zones. Now this allows us to actually work on in or within a zone. It's much much easier to work. But everything across the project is saved as V-Ray proxies. So the buildings become V-Ray proxies. The trees. You name it, it's all proxy. So we, we have very much proxy workflow, so it's quite optimized. We also then save each one of the zone models. There is a high and a low poly version of that. If I just show you what I mean there. Here we've got in the top here, one of the zone models. Everything, as I mentioned, is converted to a V-Ray proxy to keep the scene as lightweight as possible. Now to manage the proxies, we use Cyanize Ignite to quickly change the settings scene-wide or as selected, but it also allows us round-trip conversion from proxies to edit mesh. So let's just quickly have a look at what I'm talking about here. So say, here's one of our zone models. Now let's just say that the architect or someone's come and said, let's change these bollards, don't like them, um, for example, well, in this in this case, let's change it to this lamppost. I'm not sure why anyone would want to do that. But then you can see now we've just changed it just like that. Here we have an edit poly. Now we want to convert that over to a proxy because we shouldn't really have you know geometry in this scene. Again, using Ignite's workflow tool, we just select the folder. This would go back to the database, and then we convert that over to a proxy. You can see here it's now a V-Ray proxy. We now change it to a different display format. I've gone and changed that to a whole mesh, which is probably not great for a demo. Neither is the bounding box there. That looks ridiculous. So let's just put that back to whole mesh. You can see how quickly it is to change the display setting. Now let's say that you wanted to actually convert that back to edit mesh. So I've just converted that back. Then I'm able to actually update or modify that. And once complete, I can just put that straight back into proxy again without anything moving around. So that's now back as a V-Ray proxy. And then let's just we'll put that into preview mode. And say also that You've got a whole load of trees that they've got different transforms on, rotations, etc. And maybe landscape architect comes along and says, look, can you change that tree? Since everything's a proxy, we can use the same technique and just update it just like that. Nice and simple. Now selecting everything and then putting the whole zone model back into or changing the display setting. So let's put that back to bounding box update that and that should be that model complete but you can see it's a very very fast workflow working backwards and forwards with the the proxy back to edit mesh and, and back again so moving on that was looking at the database so everything involved from importing converting to proxies and saving the zone models in both high and low poly falls within the database. Now, for each client project that comes in, we treat that differently. What tends to happen here is 
the zone models are XRAFed into the project scene folders. Say, for example, you're working on, a, or we've, we've been commissioned to produce a bunch of images for an interior. Now, that is a project folder. So the zone models are XRAFed into the project folders. And then in that project itself, all the cameras, the 3D assets, again, if it's an interior, things like the furniture, uh, the lighting, the textures, everything related to that specific project stays within the project itself. Now, this allows our artists to use other software. So they could be using Corona, they could be using Arnold. And it doesn't affect or doesn't have an impact on the the database or the zone models. Now, looking at that moving forward, or on these examples, you've got some interiors. These were done in Corona. But, for example, these were models that were XREFed in from the database, and then we updated the detail to the courtyard. And that detail is then saved back into the database for other projects to use. So if we look at these 360 panoramas, it means that this, as we work on a project by project basis, any detail that we feel will be beneficial to the overall master plan, such as you know when we get down to street level, can be reused by other projects very, very simply. So all of this is 3D. tons of these across the site and they're able to visit site they can use these on their phones but it's also a really really good way of inspecting each location and as buildings or well, are being developed and come online now we have moved in the last year or so to real-time client reviews now for this we're using chaos groups project lavina why this is fantastic for us with a V-Ray pipeline or 3ds Max V-Ray pipeline is that there's no setup needed. All, all we need to do is export a VR scene and within a minute or two, we're up and running in Project Lavina. Now, the images here on the right-hand side are taken straight within Lavina. There's no rendering involved. These are essentially screen grabs. This year, it's allowed us to hold video conference meetings with our clients who many of them are working from home. So, you know, using a Zoom or another technique, we can actually take this model, which I'll show you now. We can, in real time, we can change the lighting. We can play around with it and we can get immediate client feedback. And again, it's all V-Ray. There was no need to update the textures or or no setup. This this took literally two minutes to bring into Lavina um, for this demo and show you what's going on. So it's proving to be very, very helpful for our clients and also for our own internal team. So we're using this just to inspect the model. You can see there there's some magenta floors that need to be textured. Okay, a little recap of the 3D Studio Max workflow. Starting from the left, always negotiate, if you can, a long-term retained contract. Uh, it's going to add value and benefit not just yourself, but it's going to benefit the client because you're going to be able to really relax and spend time getting into the project. Next, assess your project software pipeline. Is it reliable and stable? We use 3D Studio Max and V-Ray. It's, it's proven to be incredibly beneficial to us. Assess your workflow. Are you factoring design progression? Your design is always going to move on until it's built. Optimize your master plan into manageable file sizes and zones. Make sure you do yourself a favor and do your computer a favor. Don't try and load everything 
all at once because it's unnecessary. You don't need to do that. Build a client central database that's accessible to each new project that comes online. And then finally, create and use tools designed for your type of work. In this case, large master plans. Okay, let's jump into now the digital app and look at that. In a nutshell, what is the digital app? It's a sales tool that reinforces the brand buyer confidence. Let's just look at that briefly. So here we've got the client brief. That, to be honest, it took quite a while for the client to actually narrow down exactly what they wanted. There were so many ideas. But down below here, we have three main points. One, it needed to work as a narrative letting agent tool to present to prospective tenants the whole Wembley story. Now, typically what happens with, if you like, sales agents or letting agents is they want to cut to the chase. They want to, they want to make that sale. They leave out sometimes the whole story, you know, the, the story of Wembley. So this allowed them to actually, if, if you like, a script to work off. It needed to help the agents present the overall features of each building and narrow their selection before going on site visits to the apartments with customers. Now, given the fact that it takes 15, 20 minutes to walk from one side to another and the, the letting office is smack bang in the middle of the project, if a prospective tenant or an interested party wanted to see three apartments, one here, one over here, and one over there, there's a lot of legwork that they've got to do to discover that maybe they only needed to go to the building over here. This helps them narrow and focus in before actually going on site. We needed to promote the live activities and stream social media that are currently taking place across the site. Given the fact that the National Stadium is smack bang in the middle and you've got the arena here, there's activities happening literally every day on site. So that needed to come into the app as well. Other things included, the client wanted the ability for the app to respond to the time of day in which a prospective tenant visited the, the sales office. So say they, they turned up after work, they wanted the app to be able to change to a nighttime or if it was during the day, turn to a daytime. So there's a lot of things working here. So we needed to really think hard of how we could actually address this. Now, one of the first things we did was realize that we couldn't do all this in house. So we needed to actually partner with interactive experts that had wider skills than we did. So we partnered with the UK PropTech consultancy and creative agency called Lucid Environments. And one of the great advantages we had is that Lucid were based in our building so we could work as one team on the project together. When we all got together and we sat down and we started assessing the, the project and its limitations, there were quite a few questions that we needed to address. Firstly, can we make use of the 3D Studio Max model? How do we create a new visual 3D feel in line with the existing branding? We need to develop a platform that brings together a wide variety of media. This included photography, films, floor plans, CGI's, information, social media. There was so much that the app had to actually try and bring together all, all within the same platform. Now, it also must be delivered and usable on a variety of devices. These included PC, tablets, touchscreen, and media wall. It should also allow for video conferencing. It must be user-friendly with an easy-to-follow UX. In addition to this, we also needed to communicate the community-orientated experience across the entire 85-acre Wembley Park. Plus, we needed to ensure that it was easily and cost-effectively updatable. Always comes down to money at the end of the day. <laughs> right. 
So the big thing that we needed to address is the elephant in the room. The fact that we had a 7 billion polygon model that contained nearly 4,000 or over 4,000 V-Ray proxies, 14,000 texture maps and 25 XREFs was a huge, huge task and something we needed to really address. The client wanted to use this model in some way. We needed to try and look at how we could actually work on a model that remained live during the course of the project, needed to be continually updated, and how we could get that into a game engine. The other consideration we needed to look at were the client budgetary issues, whether or not A, they were willing to pay for such an asset to be moved across to a game engine. So we evaluated our workflow and looked at both Unity and Unreal, and that some of the issues we came up against is we would need to reassemble the whole scene in a game engine, we would need to retexture the whole scene, and then we did ask the client, did they or would they be prepared to spend a lot of money, potentially months of work, and the answer came back, no. So on that, we needed to come up with a different solution. How could we still use this asset and how can we actually bring it into a game engine to meet the client brief? So let's look at what we came up with. Now, instead of diving into the whole of the Unity project itself, I'm just gonna focus on the 3DS Max and the 3D navigational aspect of it. So Lucid came up with a genius idea. It's called the Spatial Index, and it was a way of holding all the different information within a 3D navigatable Unity environment. This meant that CGI's, photographs, floor plans, all the different media that needed to be displayed in the app could all be held within Unity. The other solution we had by going down a Unity route is it was the only off-the-shelf technology that allowed for integration of all the client requirements. Looking then at the 3D navigation and interactivity, we came up with three separate ideas. One was a 3D dynamic turntable using the high detailed work that we'd produced in 3D Studio Max. Next was a 3D dynamic turntable, but a simplified model. And then finally, on a localized level, we came up with a carousel navigation. So a way of actually interacting on a building level. It's worth noting that the high detail model could rotate in one axis only, whereas the other two were rotatable in full 360. So let's quickly then have a look at the dynamic turntable of the 3DS Max model. The idea here that we eventually came to is based on projection mapping. This allowed us to render out static renders from 3D Studio Max and align those to the Unity 3D model or the simplified model. Now that gave us incredible memory savings because there, there was no way we were going to be able to bring a 7 billion poly model into Unity. Using this technique meant that we could use the simplified model as a way of masking the detailed frames or the static renders and then overlay information and highlighting of things like the pop-up names for the buildings and in site-wide information. And we could do that now in real time. The huge advantage to us as a team meant that the 3DS Max V-Ray team could continue working right up to the deadline and the Unity team could sim simply bring in those rendered frames and they'd be automatically aligned to the model. Now let's look at the simplified one. Now this was exported out of Max and imported into, into Unity. Again, it allowed for the information and highlighting of different buildings. But we also added trigger animation to this model because now this is fully interactive. We're able to zoom in, spin it around, but we wanted to add a sense of playfulness and fun. So things such as, you know, you can see the Zeppelin and planes and, and cars, etc. That was, it was all added just to give a sense of fun. Okay, so the carousel navigation, 
essentially that was a device that we wanted to use that allowed the user a touchscreen way of actually pulling in all the information dynamically. So looking at the screen here on the right hand side, for example, depending on which angle you were looking at or say you'd rotated the model, that would pull information such as what you've seen there it would pull the imagery and the photographs of the rooftops or for example if you were looking at an apartment it would bring up all the apartment images depending on the angle of the model that you're looking at so as you can see in the top left these were early concepts that we came up with which drove the whole idea okay so it's about time that we just jumped in and looked at the final app so I'm going to hand over to Neil Small from Lucid, who will talk you through the app itself. This is a quick interactive demonstration uh, of RT for interactive presentation. Um, this is built for touchscreen, um, but it can also be built, be built for any interactive device. And just using a finger, it gives the user full control of this entire 3D environment. All of this sits on a Unity platform um, and all the content um, has been created by a combination of different um, suppliers, different times, and then put all into the same place. We could switch between different views day and night to give a more photorealistic um, idea of the entire uh, neighborhood. And we can also switch uh, to a simplified infographic style which will allow us then to bring up information about certain things, locations. And we can click on various things within this to bring up more information about those establishments on site, food and drink, entertainment, etc. Coming back to the day view quickly, we've got the ability to pick certain 360 locations, spin around and view certain aspects of the site. And then, of course, we can decide to view particular buildings in more detail as well. Overview summaries, and then we can actually move into, again, 3D representations of these individual buildings, and then start interacting with them, either by clicking on the content around them, for example. Unlike Tom, I'm an early bird. Video content. Much wants to ease into the day. Julie calls it. Or by clicking on the building itself and highlighting, in, for, for instance, in this case, all the external areas that are accessible by residents. We can bring up lovely quotes from people who live there. And of course, return to the start and pick any one of these other buildings as well. Hope you like it. Really, just to quickly wrap up, here's the three D model uh, as we sort of move through the to the daytime. Transitioning into nighttime, where we opted to because the Wembley Arch has colored lights on it so as you spin around the lights change uh, you can see that we've got little cars moving around so it's we've, we've discovered that people love to give the the turntable a real spin and the cars go much much faster which seems to be quite amusing for the agents who use it So I think that is it. In conclusion, just to wrap up, we've gone over the retained knowledge and how you should consider working on, on a project over a long period of time. Uh, next, we talked about the 3DS Max workflow that we use, try to negotiate a retained contract, 
and really look to use the best tools for your workflow. Finally, the interactive UX. Starting from the left, always partner with experts and stick to what you excel in to deliver the best experience for your client. Always question the client brief and drill down to what's important. The success of your app is dependent in the end on the end user, so make it simple to use. It's no point to making a really, really complicated app if no one's going to use it. Next, balance the aesthetics with information. It's a sales tool and must add value and sell. Work in parallel with expert teams. Don't try and enforce your client to actually a, a deadline that, that they can't work to. Everyone likes to work up into the wire. And then finally, design your app for easy and cost-effective updating. Okay, so here are the team that worked on the project, uh, both the Urban VFX team and Lucid Environments. So it was a great, great project to work on. We all enjoyed it. And I hope you've enjoyed today's talk. Thank you very much. Here's a bit of information about me. If you wanted to reach out, if you've got any questions, then please do so. I'd love to hear from you. And thank you, Autodesk, for having me. It's been great. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.